Welcome to our review on competition and interdependence. So the first thing we're going to look at is this idea of competition. Now, in order to actually survive, then plants and animals are going to need certain materials from their surroundings. And if those materials that they need to survive are in limited supply, then they're going to have to compete for them. And what we find is that as a result of that competition, then if you've got an organism that's not well adapted, so it's a bit weaker than the others in the area, they're less likely to get that resource. So that will mean they will either leave the area in order to go and find it somewhere else, or they will just die. So what we're looking at here is that idea of being well adapted in order to then compete for resources better. So let's think about what animals and plants will actually compete for. So if we think about plants, first of all, then we're going to be competing for all of those things that they need to actually survive that are potentially in limited supply. So that would be water, it's light, the minerals that we find in the soil, the actual space to allow them to grow and the carbon dioxide. So all of those are examples of things that our plants will compete for. If we think about animals, then we've got the water, the food, then we come on to things like breeding partners, so they quite often fight about that in the animal kingdom. The territory in which they live, because they obviously need a certain area in order to find all these things. And also shelter to keep them out of the elements. So just make sure that you know a couple of examples of the things that both plants and animals will compete for. So if you remember from our previous review, population is the number of organisms of a species that live in an area. And what we find is that when we're talking about competition, that has a direct effect on the population size. And what we mean by that is that if we've actually got a large amount of food available in an area, then the population size will increase because there's food for all of them. Therefore, they will all have enough to survive. If, however, the amount of food was very limited, then some of those individuals within the population wouldn't get the food they needed to survive and therefore the population would decrease. But do remember that when we're talking about this competition, it does come back to that work you did lower down the school on adaptations. So those organisms that are best adapted to that particular environment are more likely to outcompete those less well adapted. So the second idea that we're going to come on to look at is this idea of interdependence. Now, when we're talking about interdependence, what we're referring to is how different organisms actually depend on each other within that community. So they've got what's called an ecological relationship with each other. And we can divide these relationships up into three main types. The first ecological relationship we're going to look at is predation. Now, when we talk about predation, we're looking at the relationship between predators and prey. And one of the most common questions that they like to ask you is all linked in to the predator prey graph you can see at the bottom there. So they could very well ask you to describe the shape of the graph, in which case it's say what you see. So you can talk about the fact that the red line, which is the hair, increases. And then a short while after, we get an increase in the lynx population. Whereas when the hair population decreases, a short while after, the lynx population decreases. That's all we need for a describe. The other kind of question they could ask you is explain the shape of the graph. Now, explain means you say what you see and you use science to say why we see that. So we'd stick with the same explanations that as the hair population increases, a short while later, the lynx population increases. But we need to say the why. So when the hair population increases, there's more food for the lynx and therefore a larger number of the lynx survive. So their population goes up. As the lynx population increases, they eat more of the hares, which leads to a decrease in the hare population. And that then means that a short while after that, we see a decrease in the lynx population because there's less hares available for them to eat. So some are going to starve and die. The second type of relationship we've got is mutualism. Now, something that is showing a mutualistic relationship is one where both organisms benefit. And the example I've given you here is of oxpeckers and buffalo. So you can see the lovely pictures down there. 
So the oxpecker will benefit because on that buffalo are lots of different parasites. So they get a nice little food supply there. And the buffalo benefits because it's having its parasites eaten by the birds. The third and final ecological relationship is parasitism. Now, this is one where the parasite is going to benefit, but the host is going to suffer. So it's a very one sided relationship we've got here. And a good example is the tapeworm. So I've given you a lovely zoomed in picture of the tapeworm's head on the bottom right there. You can see all the different segments of its body in the middle and then a tapeworm actually embedded in the gut on the left. So if you've got a tapeworm, then what it's actually doing is it's going to steal all of those nutrients from your digestive system. So it benefits, but you're suffering because you're not getting any of those nutrients which are needed to keep you alive. Hopefully at the end of this video, you can now recall the three ecological relationships, give examples about them and talk about that predator prey graph. You can also recall what organisms compete for and how they're actually going to outcompete one another.